There are 7.5 billion living souls on planet Earth. How could we all possibly be relevant? We are all relevant because within each of us is a custom-built, unique story. We are all significant, we do matter, and I'm going to prove it one amazing story at a time. My home province of Ontario makes up 0.2% of the global population, and we're going to start there. One day, I will call on you. Greetings from Treblecock Studio. I'm your host, David Joyce, and this is Episode 3 of Richard's Journey. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a quick second and thank you for taking part in this journey of Richard's and myself as well. This is Episode 7 of It Happened in Ontario, and I've been learning on the fly. My guests have been brilliant and giving while I learn what it means to be a good host. I'll get there. Have faith. I haven't asked you to go out and leave a review yet, but it'd be great if you took a few moments to help us rise in the charts. It'll get us found by others. I have a great list of upcoming guests that I think you're going to love. Okay, great. Now back to this episode. We're learning why Richard took a few steps back after coming such a long way in controlling his OCD after his brother Mike bought a house, and they were no longer in fear of cross-contamination from tenants. Bed bugs, anyone? I'm that kind of person who's got to Google everything when it comes to this kind of stuff too. And one of the things is I'll just randomly Google uh, bed bug hysteria. I can't, I'm not finding nothing when it comes to the head, to the hype thing. Cause I, I want to, I want to believe that it's hard to get them, but it's really not. No. And you know, that's just, it's one of those things you just oversee something or overread something and you believe every single way it's going to happen and it's going to happen to you. Yep. So some, some people don't even need OCD to have that kind of fears and everything else. I just believe that if something bad's going to happen, it's going to happen to them. Well, I think you could throw that into my mix too. Bed bugs obviously are one of those things that, uh, you, you know, you fear, uh, you don't need to have OCD for it, but, uh, it's it's like a few of the other phobias I got included the OCD just enough to be there. You know, you talked about if you had a fly in your room, how everything right. would have to shut down. So I couldn't even imagine what you would go through if if you had a infestation of some kind in the house. It would probably send you off the rail. See, I'll, I'll get panic attacks or anxiety attacks when it comes to uh, different things, but. If I get a fly, the first thing is like immense focus, right? And just like try to just control, like uh, track this thing, and you know shut shut doors to other levels and things like that because you're containing it. It's funny because we're all we're all pretty trained like that in here. That if we get a fly, it's like immediately just like shut. Okay, shut the shut the door to the basement. Um, run up and shut all the bedroom doors and the bathroom doors and. Uh, make sure the cupboard doors are fully secured shut and open the blinds because we know that the flies like to go to the windows, etc. We all go into protocol and it's, it's uh-huh. funny. And then but you, you'd be amazed what you find out what you can kill a fly with instantly without having to crush it or, or touch it or, or get dirty with that. <laughs> I, I, we, we once removed a whole deck that sits off the, off the ground um, 10 feet. We once removed the deck with uh, fire tongs and never touched a single uh, sliver of wood with our hands. Really, eh? Just to just to change it out, I'll tell you that was that was a chore. Yeah, no doubt. And we put the new stuff down, no problem. And but uh, to get the old stuff out, and and that lends to uh, phobias of things like raccoons and uh, what raccoons carry. They carry a nasty little uh, parasite called roundworm. And uh, it could get in your bloodstream, and then it can, it uh, gets into your brain. It can kill you. And a lot of people don't realize how bad it is that if you have a raccoon that uh, passes, you know, uh, feces, how how much they say you've got to go. If you go to the CDC, they tell you how bad you, you have to treat it, and how like it's it's darn near having to call the hazmat team. These parasite eggs, which could be like 50 million in one passing that they uh their feces that these things are so light they can be very airborne and you know, when they're in your attic and some of them last for years the eggs last in the feces for years as well 
and that uh, you could be breathing this in and then they hatch and they go in your intestines and they just the, the parasite attacks your spinal cord goes all up into your brain it's fatal it's near non-treatable that's what led to us having to remove the deck was um we had like 15 and 20 feet uh, spruce or spa or pines or whatever yeah that ran up the side of the yard all the way up past the deck so it was easy for anything to climb and get on the deck so under the under the patio furniture and everything else when it was clearing clearing it out in the spring we had a a a little turd sitting there we just learned at that point in time just how how fatal and deadly and no good it is to find raccoon poop so yeah it was so the deck just, had to go the had to go and uh there's without, two things without to, touching it yeah oh yeah so i can't tell you if it was raccoon but once we got into the raccoon hysteria uh, of you know stay away from their feces that was it it actually kept us off our deck for uh three years two years we didn't even step out the door really like richard says he brainstorms ways to overcome major ocd issues so how does somebody remove a 12 by 20 foot deck without touching it we're talking about how how it was great when we were for a little bit able to use the deck and, you know, it's just, it was, well, we could just uh, tear it down and rebuild it. And I'm like, I don't know, that seems like a lot of work. And that's where you're going to have to get permits and engineers and whoever else come in here and build this right. Because I don't trust me and you to put together something that, we, you know, it's going to fall maybe. And so like, well, I don't know what to do then. I don't want to write this deck off. And I'm like, well, we may have to. And then. It just started brainstorming and was like, well, we can use any kind of pickup method for the wood. And then we'll just have to remove the wood. And he's like, how are we going to do that? I said, well, first step is we're going to have to get out on the deck, have a look and see if it's tacked in by nails or screws. And, of course, it was tacked in by screws. And half of them are buried. So we we bought some really long... Um, uh, drill bits or, or bits to get the screws out because there was no way I was putting a drill close to the deck. Right. And couldn't get them out. They were too buried. So then we end up having to buy one of those little drill saw hole things. Yep. Where, where you could just drill in and it creates the hole. And we, we got one that was just enough to uh, it's circumference around the screw hole and away we went and we just lifted the boards out with the um, with fire tongs, the way you would pick up fire logs with. And it just filed them off the edge of the other part of the deck and uh, we'd take four or five of them off at a time and start laying down the new stuff. You know, four boards would come off and two would go on. So kept it well away from the dirty stuff and kept the new stuff well, you know, good distance. Sure there's no contamination. That's right. And it took us about a week to do this because... We had a lot of uh, we had a lot of snags and trying to get some of the wood up. So wow. and then yeah, it was it was very tedious. It took a whole took a whole week to do. And now uh, the deck is a go-to zone. Yes, we just we can go out there now. We're back out there in our bare feet and our socks and and whatnot. But um, and that's funny that it, you know that's an outside world, and uh, you could be out there in your bare feet and socks, and it doesn't strike me. We got four cameras around the house, and I knew when we put these cameras up, and it was uh, and it was just this past December, put the cameras up, and all I kept saying was, this is going to be a bad idea. And Mike's like, no, it's a great idea. It's great. Uh, you know, it's going to it's going to serve its purpose and everything else. And I said, yeah, I know, but you know how much wildlife we're going to see that's going to inundate our yard? Yeah. Because we live off the back of a valley. Yeah, so naturally you're going to see lots of critters. Yeah, they, there's uh, there's even been, cause, because we've become not professionals in this, but uh, we're identifying the poop now when we see stuff. One day we were going up the little steps up right up the side of the house, and uh, there was a really long one there on the steps, and we looked and we are like, what is that? 
So a little bit of quick Googling, and there was coyote poop. Really? They have a very distinctive one. It's It could be up like about eight inches or even about almost up to a foot long, but pencil thin. Now, Amazing. coyote might be a friend because raccoon is on the menu. That's right. <laughs> Raccoons and skunks are on the menu. And we hear, we hear the coyote pups because the creek valley that's right behind us is, is pretty pretty populated with a lot of that stuff and people see them through the area when a frog a frog passes that you, you'd think a dog did you have really, no I... idea how much a frog can pass that you think you have a dog <laughs> it's amazing and now you're a poop professional yeah well yeah that's just it i never thought that that I would be doing it and you know to tell to tell my story to people sometimes you know a neighbor it's just a whole different ball game in itself because, you know, you get your neighbors who see you on your lawn doing something. And the first thing they do is they run over and they want to introduce you to something that they found in their yard or, right. you know, or, or they want to try to give you something. Uh, you know, I've had all this, but there's still lots of stuff they do that they don't think about. Right. And I've had lengthy conversations with each of my neighbors and, uh, they they understand to a point, but then I try to explain to them that includes anybody that's in my house. Don't don't try to offer them anything, hand them anything. They won't touch none of your belongings. Don't don't whatever. It and they'd be like, well, why does that? I'm, I'm like, that's that's cross contamination. That raises that risk. So the backyard presents its very own challenges. Remember, Richard wasn't present for the viewings before the purchase of the house. His first time on the property, well, it isn't going so well. He's like, so what do you think? Mike's asking me, what do you think about this? And I'm like, I don't like it. And I hadn't even been inside yet. Uh -huh. He's like, oh, come on. He goes, I, I see so much potential back here. Well, this is where it comes to the neighbors and things like that, because the first thing I did was, all right, the yard is going to be like the extension of the house. You know, I could do stuff out here. Yeah, it's fenced in because of the pool, and uh, people will not be just wandering in. It's gated off, etc. So I did. I got out there and I, I I did a whole hell of a lot. I I leveled the ground. I got rid of probably in the area of about a hundred trees. There are all these pines and uh, cedars or whatever, and uh, added so much more with the distance to the yard. And then put it in a deck and put it in a shed and and everybody used to and put in like four gardens or five gardens and everybody's just like, Wow, this place never looked like this before. It was just all trees and the ground was so unleveled and I leveled it all. I I went out there and done this. It took like two or three years to do. But uh I did it all and that was it was like therapy for the O C D. Oh, well, that's good. Fun stuff though. Yeah, well, so, now you have this this great living area that's, like you said, an extension of the house. It just it makes your personal world a lot bigger. But it's amazing that you go from um, laying in your bed and uh, before moving, I had ideas of we were going to do vegetable gardens. And it, and it actually had just yet to strike about the raccoons, yeah. about just how bad they are to you. So it was like the vegetable garden idea was um, was kibosh because the yard didn't look like it was capable. Like it didn't look like where where would we put this? Like it, the yard just didn't look very inhabitable. Right. And to me anyway. And and that was the first thing I said to Mike was uh, I don't like it. He's like, oh, there's so much potential here. But it, as I was saying, that's a lot of therapy for me to go out the door one day and say, where do I start? And then the transformation is, is amazing. Whereas I used to be bedridden and didn't see the light of day for sometimes eight, 10 months in the, in the year. Richard has come a long way. No more four hour showers. And many of the routines that consumed so much of their days were whittled down to manageable events. One of those events was the door locking routine to a lot of people they wouldn't understand you know a 40 minute shower and an hour to fold laundry to you is a major breakthrough 
compared to how life was not that long ago. That's right. Even when we go through checking the doors, it used to be, it could take up to an hour to go through and make sure everything's shut down for the night. Right. And uh, that, that came with ritual and notes and, 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 you know, going over it and then reviewing it and everything else. Now the procedure takes five minutes. I remove myself from it and just kind of bear down and put trust in the mic to do it by himself go through just the a regular lockdown and look and go my doors are locked yeah my so windows just, are locked just to go through the entire house and make sure everything's locked yeah and now he does that in five minutes and and in me it took with me the process and everything else was an hour and, and how long did that minutes, go on for for the hour lockdown so about two years, but it wasn't always like that. And that was, that's why it was kind of easy to get out of it. But when I, I when something is going on, um, like that particular incident, um, the method we were doing before, somebody had said, well, you guys are loud. And, you know, Mike, Mike's checking. It's very loud. And I, and the procedure was, was that when Mike was closing doors and blinds and everything else, he was actually slamming them so I can hear that they closed. Right. Or if he would close a lock, it would snap. So it didn't matter if it was one in the morning or one in the afternoon. If he was doing these things, he was slamming doors. He was slow. He was slamming the blinds. He was, you know, things a slam a window. And every time he do things like that, he'd look at me and goes, "You realize you're gonna break these things." And then the first thing I thought was, well, then if I can't hear it, I have to witness it. Right. So then it's the moment I witnessed it, it's like I'd go stand there and be like, do it again. It don't look right to me. Right. The window looks like it's partially could be opened. Open it, close it, lock it. Let me look at it again. So we do that. And then it got inventive where I would use uh, an iPad or whatever, like handheld device. I would take pictures and it seemed to speed things up at that point. But then I would compile everything that I took pictures of, go back and then talk about it, note it and say, do you remember shutting the door? And it would be yes. And I'd be like, do you remember you said something while you were shutting the door? And then it's like I would get. I would get some the look like, oh my God, now I've got to learn dialogue while I'm doing this. And I'd be like, well, do you remember we had a discussion while we were locking the door? Do you remember what my fourth word was? Be like, no. And I'd be, well, I do. And it, and it'd be like, well, I don't. And to me, that was like you weren't paying enough attention. You weren't paying enough attention to your surroundings that it was important that you knew everything we were doing that you would realize that uh, what my fourth word was. And sometimes checking the door would take two hours because I'm like, I'm not going to coach you or give you hints because if I do, that's, that's like me telling you. And then it's not legit. If I tell you, I don't trust myself. And I had to give you those words. Well, I'm not, I'm not hearing it from you. So it'd be like, oh my God, what did we talk about? Okay, what was it that we said? And then we'd get it wrong. And then we'd be like, well, I think we've got to go back and check. Do it over. So we could go back and go through some uh, door locking again and everything else. And I'd be standing there going, okay, pay pay attention to what's being said, being done. And I I just, I could just see the look in Mike's eyes like, are you kidding me? Richard lives his OCD from the inside out. But what about Mike? Obviously their bond is otherworldly, and I admire it. The commitment involved must come with a steep cost, and it's time to hear from Mike. On the next episode, that is. Well, I hope you're enjoying the series, and I'm going to continue to produce It Happened in Ontario without third-party sponsors. All I ask is if you could subscribe and rate the podcast so that we can share our stories with other people. I won't object to you visiting the Patreon site to buy me a delicious Jameson's, but the scribe and share is how we rise and shine. See you next time. 
It Happened in Ontario is recorded at Treblecock Studio in downtown Peterborough. For more information, go to treblecock.ca. Thanks as always to my dear friend Paul Thompson for the music. I've blessed others, been blessed in return. I've seen a few miracles. Life is a mystery, I'll keep my eyes.